Hello, HQR 3100. Today we're going to be doing our introduction to financial statements. This um, lecture, I don't have an accompanying reading because this is sort of a hodgepodge of things, of content from um, various chapters. Uh, and in a way, I apologize, it's a little bit, I've tried to organize this as best I can, but some of this is also some things that I probably should have uh, discussed earlier. Um, next year, I might change things around. And you may recall when I, I mentioned to you, I, I don't really like the order of the textbook because I find the textbook very repetitive as it goes along. Um, but I'm going to need to work on a little bit more on how I present this. So anyway, bear with me a little bit. So we have talked about the accounting of the three sectors. And um, we also, you know, you, we we're comparing the three sectors. But when you were talking about the art of accountancy, we looked at the differences between the three sectors. So if you remember, we looked at, um, you know, the worth of an organization. So assets minus liabilities. Well, in the private sector, they look at equity. In the nonprofit sector, is called net assets. And in the uh, public sector, it's called a fund balance because they use, um, you know, fund accounting, as does not-for-profit usually use fund accounting as well. We'll talk about that in a bit. So when we're talking about surplus money, and by the way, this is a slide I did not have in the Art of Accountancy lecture. I did add this. I'm, um, you might want to add this, uh, you know, to your table, but I thought I should put what surplus money, surplus money then. So that would be when your assets are greater than your liabilities. That's called obviously profit in the private sector. It's still called net assets in the nonprofit sector, and it's called a fund balance, meaning like a positive fund balance in the public sector. We also talked about the number of funds, you know, in the private sector, they're really, they're not using fund accounting. They have kind of one fund, one bottom line. In the not-for-profit sector, they have multiple funds. And these are often separated into operating funds and reserve funds. So an operating fund is set aside for the operating budget, where reserves are for unexpected costs. And in the public sector, they also use this kind of like fund accounting too. So it's multiple funds. When we're talking about, you know, things going out, costs in the private sector, it's expenses, nonprofit could be expenditures or expenses. It kind of depends on if it's American or uh, Canadian. So you could use either term there. I'll, I won't be picky, like for example, in an exam. Uh, and the public is obviously uh, expenditures. We also went through the different type of accounting that is used. Remember that the only thing you really need to understand about this is that in um, full accrual accounting means that it includes depreciation. So that's the concept that fixed assets get used up. They decrease in value. In the public sector, they used modified accrual accounting because they do not um, uh, they do not depreciate fixed assets. The other difference is, is like you know, when you're uh, now this isn't an accounting class. So I'm just trying to introduce you to these concepts, but you also see um, like people talk about for profit or profit accounting is also different. I've posted um, this as a uh, PDF on in this unit uh, on the course shell. This comes from actually chapter four of the textbook, which you read last uh, week. Um, and this is looking then at the terms that are used. So for the exam, it's important for you to understand this, um, these. Now, in the next couple of lectures, we're going to be going over this more. But you need to understand that we have you know, revenues and expenses. Expenses include things like cost of goods sold, which is how much it costs to actually make something. Um, and that includes the direct costs 
but it excludes indirect costs such as overhead. Direct costs are the cost of materials to produce a, a product or service, where indirect costs is things like um, labor, equipment, rent, utilities, etc. When we're looking at the totals then, your gross profit is simply revenue minus the cost of goods sold. Gross profit margin is then your gross profit divided by revenues. Um, net income is simply revenue minus the costs. That's direct and indirect. And net profit margin is the net income after taxes uh, divided by revenues. Now this might seem like a lot of mumbo jumbo right now to you, but for now, just make sure that you sort of, you know, have this table handy to understand what these concepts are in the next couple of units when we're looking at balance sheets and income statements. You're going, these will be applied and you'll then understand what these terms really mean. We need to kind of talk about fund accounting. So fund accounting is used in nonprofit and uh, public services often. It might not always be used in nonprofit. Um, this part's not in, in the textbook. But basically, we know then that in the private sector, they have one fund. In nonprofit and public, they can't make re revenue, so they often use then fund accounting. By definition, according um, to the CICA, which um, apologize, I can't think of the official name, but that's the Canadian Accounting uh, Board. Um, fund accounting comprises the collective accounting procedures resulting in a self-balancing set of accounts for each fund established by legal, contractual, or voluntary actions of an organization. And these, the fund can be about assets or liabilities, revenues, you know, anything. Um, it involves some sort of segregation of, you know, resources. In the public sector, we talked about um, that in government, they use general funds. So that's what's a group of accounts that are usually segregated, you know, by department um, in government. And where there, especially where funding comes from a multitude, multitude of revenue sources. So for example, um, you know, some might be from taxes, some might be from uh, something else. You know, there's all these different sources of revenue that goes into this, to their operating fund. In fund accounting, there's generally three categories of funds or what they call contributions. Accounting for these three categories of funds makes balance sheets for nonprofit and public organizations more complicated compared with for profit, which only have one fund. Um, the response to keep track of multiple funds generating reports that are similar to balance sheets and income statements for each fund, and each fund usually has its own budget. So the categories we're going to talk about are restricted, endowment, and unrestricted funds. So on the exam, it's important for you to understand the difference between these. So a restricted fund is a contribution subject to externally imposed stipulations that specify the purpose for which the contributed asset is to be used. So it means that the funds are restricted, just what the word it says, that they can only be used by what, by some sort of rule. Um, in, and sometimes this can be like, you know, it's a um, law, laws of what these funds are restricted to. In the U.S., they have another type of fund under restricted funds called temporarily restricted funds. And that is ones that are, uh, your, the textbook talks about this in Chapter 8. Um, these are often used to accept donations for capital projects. So capital projects means like, you know, getting enough resources to, for example, a uh, uh, build a, a building or something. But in Canada, a contribution restricted for the purchase of a capital asset uh, is in itself a type of restricted contribution. We don't we don't have the word temporary restricted funds. And a lot of this then is about 
having transparency of not putting donation money with operating money. Now we've kind of talked about endowment funds, I believe, before, um, but an endowment is often like it's a ty it's a special type of restricted fund, um, and it's usually that the resources that are contributed to it um, can uh, like are used for a specific uh, purpose, and it's usually it's the interest rate on the money that is used. So, for example, you might have contributors contributors to an endowment fund for, like, let's say, scholarships. Let's just say that that money is ten thousand dollars. Well, the ten thousand dollars isn't used to give the scholarships; it's the interest rate from that money being invested. So, endowment funds are usually like they have to have a specific name. And the point of this is that if you're donating money, it's to it's to ensure that the donor's money is actually going to the, you know, the reason, the, like what they wanted it to, to be for. So this is more of a long-term donation. And once the certain prince, like the principal and the money reaches a certain amount, then the interest is earned annually in per, in per perpetuity, I can never say that word, pardon me, to cover the costs. So, in per, uh, and that means like for life or in some cases forever. And then finally, there are unrestricted funds. So this is a contribution that's, it's not restricted, it's, uh, and it's not endowment. It can be used for many things. It's usually for operating purposes or like an operating fund. Um, it's often specifically the money that's used for uh, the main uh, programs. And in the case of not-for-profits, it might be like their memberships and fees, uh, donations, etc., unrestricted donations. So in not-for-profit accounting, as you may have noticed, they talk a lot about contributions. So that's a, a contribution is, by definition, a non-reciprocal transfer to a not-for-profit. Um, and it could be cash or any other sort of asset. Often in Canada, government funding provides, uh, you know, governments give money to not-for-profit organizations, and it's considered to be what's called a contribution. Um, now. In this case, usually then these contributions would be put into probably a restricted fund that's to only be used for operating costs or something like that. Now, I have found a little more information about nonprofit accounting in Canada. There's actually, to make it complicated, there's actually two methods that um, are allowed to be followed. There's called the deferral method and the restricted fund method. And I'll explain um, what these are in a moment. So in the deferral method, restricted contributions related to expenses of future periods are deferred and recognized as revenue in the period in which the related expenses are incurred. So what does that mean? Well, it means that a not-for-profit gets a contribution, it might be restricted, and they're let's say they're getting it in 2021. They're allowed to defer getting that revenue until, let's say, 2022, when that money is going to actually be used, when there's maybe a special program and that expense can be used. Okay, so... Um, and I guess they, I don't know when they, how they choose if they use which of these methods though. But so endowment contributions are usually reported as direct increases in net assets in this method. And everything else is reported as revenue for that current period. And or, uh, organizations that use fund accounting, so I've tried, I've tried to split like not for profit might not always use fund accounting, government does though, uh, but in Canada, they might not. In their um, 
organizations that use fund accounting on their financial statements without following the restricted fund method would account for contributions under the deferral method. So that means um, if it, uh, basically if they're not following this restricted fund method, they have to follow the deferral method, basically is what that's saying. You don't need to know it quite this in total detail here. I just want you to, uh, I don't even expect you to understand the difference between deferral or restricted fund method. I just want you to know that they exist. Where a restricted fund is a special type of fund counting um, where uh, they have to report their total uh, general funds, they have to report uh, different restricted funds and endowment funds. So they do it uh, overall. And also the reporting of the financial statements, um, they are segregated on a basis other than the use of restrictions. So it's usually like from program or by geography or by department. It's not by like the type of fund. Now, when it comes to government sector accounting, Governments obviously differ from commercial uh, because they do not exist to make profit. Um, they're providing services and revenues are derived mostly from taxation. In Canada, the Chartered Professional Accountants Canada's Public Sector Accounting Board exists <laughs> and they have uh, a handbook. It's called Public Sector Accounting. It was uh, published in 1998. And it, it is what everyone follows as the guidelines. Um, and in this case, financial statements are audited annually. And it's always a private accounting firm. So for, as an example, I'm going to use St. John's Municipal Government. So each year they have to, they get all their financial statements. And then it gets audited by a private accounting firm. And as I've said here, I'm not actually sure how the firm is selected. Like, I don't know how they pick these, but maybe it's just based on, like, it could just maybe if there's accountants in the area who specialize in public accounting. Um, I'm not sure. And once the financial statements are audited, then they become, they get posted on the website for public information. And that's also, that's why you generally can't find the financial statements um, that are just released uh, in government is because they have to get audited first. So there are then accounting standards for these different financial reports that we need to understand. In Canada, we have the Financial Reporting and Assurance Standards. Um, it's the Accounting Standards Board. They set all accounting standards, which are called the generally accepted accounting pr uh, principles for all organizations um, in Canada. Uh, and one thing I've learned from researching this is that actually uh, Canada uh, is quite advanced in its accounting standards and Canada is viewed world, uh, worldwide as a, an example of um, excellent accounting practices, I guess, or a model. So you need to understand the generally accepted accounting principles. Um, there is regularity. Obviously, you have to regularly conform to the rules and laws. You have consistency. You have to enter the data exactly the same way, you know, to be consistent so that you can compare across years, compare organizations, etc. They have to be sincere meaning they have to be honest and actually reflect the financial position. You have to have prudence, meaning, again, that's sort of being sincere too, I'm not exactly sure the difference, but not making things prettier than they are. They have to be really, you know, what it is. And you have to have continuity so that the business will continue as a going concern. So, um, and why it is important to understand this? Well, we have, there's certain professional ethical standards that have to be followed, there's laws, and we also have to be transparent, whether it's for management, investors, donors, members, or taxpayers. 
Um, one thing I want to point out that is important when we're starting to learn how to actually read these financial statements is that a uh, generally accepted accounting principle is that um, negative numbers are put in brackets, in parentheses. You don't actually put a negative, okay? It's always parentheses. So I on, an, on a financial document, when something has brackets around it, it means it's negative. And why? Well, it's because a negative number, that little negative can really get lost when you're reading it. So um, it's difficult to see the minus sign. So they use brackets. Obviously, transparency is obviously a big part of the accounting principles that you're not hiding the financial position at all. So that is very important. And obviously, it's been a theme throughout this. We know that in public, they have to be the most transparent, but um, not-for-profit still needs to be transparent a bit, whereas public very rarely has to be transparent unless they're a, I'm sorry, private, unless they're, they've are uh, they gone public <laughs> as a organization. Um, obviously, uh, the reports developed have provided a clear and accurate picture of the financial condition. Um, and these things are important because it does allow managers then to take action. You know, you're not going to have to develop these reports, but you need to understand how to use them in management decisions. So you need to know what the numbers mean and whether the numbers are fairly valued. You need to understand the structure and meaning of financial reports. You need to be able to interpret this in order to take action if there's anything needed or to determine what changes need to be made. So again, I've keep saying I've said this several times already, but you need to then learn the language of accounting. You need to learn the rules of the game. How should finance finances be recorded and statements prepared? You need to learn how to interpret this in order to make sound management decisions. So there are various types of financial statements, which we are now going to go through. We have budgets, um, obviously, and now we have discussed budgets. Uh, it, we've gone through a lot about program budgets, but there's also obviously a lot of organizational budgets. Uh, and I'm not actually going to go in too much detail on, on budgets uh, uh, this term. Where then uh, you also have like the financial condition of an organization, basically like the worth of it, the assets minus the liabilities. And most of us know these as balance sheets. In the private commercial sector, they're called balance sheets. In the nonprofit sector, they're called a statement of financial position, at least in Canada. Now, in the public sector, so government, just to make it very confusing for us all. Um, in Canada, we also call it a statement of financial position, but in the US, they call it a statement of net assets. So when you hear statement of net assets, that's talking about the public sector. But in Canada, we call it a financial, still a, a statement of financial position. So in the textbook um, for government, they talk about statement of net assets. Then we have the statement of revenues and expenses during a certain time period. We call this an income statement usually. That's in commercial. And again, to make it confusing, in for nonprofit and the public sector, in the US, they call it a statement of activities. But in Canada, we call it a statement of operations. There's also some additional statements that can be uh, needed in nonprofit and public, they need a statement of cash flows and also a statement of changes in net assets. Now I'm going to be going through these a little bit briefly. I understand, again, it might sound like gobbledygook right now. I'm just introducing you to these topics and, and concepts. Or then, um, like next week, we're just focusing on balance sheets. And so we're going to talk about, you know, these, what they're called in nonprofit and public sector. The week after that, we're focusing on income statements. So, you know, the statement of activities and operations. 
Um, in, we're going to just very briefly in this uh, lecture talk about statement of cash flows and changes in net assets. So again, just introducing, you don't need to fully understand this all yet. It's an introduction. So in the private sector, they use budgets, obviously, all, all three sectors use budgets, uh, and they have balance sheets and they have income statements. But this is different when you're not making profit. In Canada, for a nonprofit organization, they have to have the statement of financial position, um, which is the, as I said, that's um, like the balance sheet. They also have a statement of, you know, activities, operations just like the income statement. They have the changes in net assets and they also have cash flows. Um, most, but not all, not-for-profit organizations publish financial statements, which are seen by both direct stakeholders like members or by members of the general public. These financial statements have to be prepared in accordance with the CICA handbook. And, you know, um, it used to be I guess uh, not-for-profit accounting used to be very tricky, and Canada's actually made a lot of progress in making changes, and that's one of um, our not-for-profit accounting, I guess, is viewed as some of the best in the world. We made a lot of progress towards making improvements in the financial reporting practices of nonprofit organizations. Um, in Canada, uh, we have uh, or for you know public sector, they have the statement, they call it a consolidated statement, by the way. I'm not going to keep saying consolidated a hundred times though. But uh, they have the state for the statement of financial positions, so that's like a balance sheet, the statement of operations, which is like the um, income statement. Then they have a statement of change in net debt and the cash flow statement. Now, personally, like uh, if you're looking at or I mean, I'm not really most people just look at the, you know, basically the balance sheets and the income statements are the most important to understand. So first, we're going to talk about budgets, because budgets really are the beginning of uh, of all of these financial statements. You know, it all starts with making a budget and budgets are usually based on income statements and um, balance sheets, too. So you need to know a few terms. So a budget, what is it? It's an accounting document that predicts how much money an organization is going to receive and how much it's going to spend. It's a plan for getting revenues. And um, it's about organizing the spending for the fiscal year. What is a fiscal year? It's the budget year that begins when the business cycle for the entity logically begins or ends. It's the period in which an organization determines its financial condition, which may or may not be the same as the calendar year. So, you know, in Canada, for example, you know, when we do um, like your pers like personal taxes, right? Um, we do it by the year. You're submitting, for example, uh, in a couple months, we're going to be submitting our taxes and it'll be for how much money we made in 2020. And but businesses submit at uh, at a different time. They have typically um, April is year end, so uh, May is the beginning of the calendar year. Another term you should understand is slack, um, and that's especially used in government, and that's money that is hidden in a budget for discretionary use. Basically, you're underestimating revenues or overestimating expenditures. So they use, like, um, it's basically like you're putting padding into the budget in order um, to make it look like everything's balanced out. So basically what it means is, like, on something you know you're going to lose money, you um, maybe in something else, you put in a little slack. It's just a, a little bit of padding. And that's especially used in government because basically um, if they don't spend all the money, then that affects their operating budget for the next year. Some other terms to understand is cash cow, 
So cash cow is a very profitable department. That's they call that because it's milked for all it's worth. Um, you know, I it's something that people it you, that's always popular and that you can charge you know high prices for. Then there's lost leaders. So they use this in my uh, in recreation. We use it too, but we often just think of this for groceries. That's the products or services sold at a loss to attract customers. So the strategy is that once customers are in the store, they're going to buy other products that are profitable for the store to sell. Um, as an example, think of like the corner, uh, your corner store, uh, like the one in St. John's that I lived near was um, they had always had the best milk. We, I, I don't know, is, you know, two cartons of milk for uh, seven fifty, best milk deal in town. They also had the cheapest bananas. Um, and uh, this is like the Irving, I think it was, or no, Ultramar, I can't remember, it doesn't matter. Anyway, and so why do they do that? Well, they, you know, first of all, I'm more likely to go and get gas there because then I can get my milk and bananas. Also, every time I walk to the store to get milk and bananas there, even though it's this little corner store, am I going to buy something else? Well, probably like coffee or maybe something else. So um, it's, they're the things that get people in the room. Um, now, we don't use this tons, but as, as an example, let's look at the works. Um, they do not make money on their walking program. I believe it's around $2. It might, it's probably increased since last looked, but $2 to use the track at the works. Well, they're not making money there. That is feed as a service, but it's also attracting customers. Like, you know, maybe people maybe start out coming to the works to use the track and then it makes them so they'll maybe become a member. We have to understand that budgeting is political, is very political. In non-for-profit, um, you are influenced by the board. So the executive director might make the budget um, and the board approves it, but like obviously they have influence. They might play favorites and have different pet projects that they want. Um, it could be that even though members are on the board to raise funds, it's easier and more fun to oversee expenditures. Uh, sometimes it's easier for them to cut the budget than to raise money to support it, for example. So it can be difficult. In the public sector, you know, um, everyone wants more money for their department. It's like there's a certain piece of pie and everyone is fighting for to get as big a slice as they can. That's how it works. They want more money, makes it easier. Who gets what, when, and how is all politics. So decisions about additional staff to be hired or cut, new facilities being built, new programs, all of that is at on the budget level. So, um, and often then, like you have mismanagement of money too, because you have to spend this money at the end of the fiscal year or they're going to lose it. Um, and so, so sometimes it's like kind of wasted, but you're just buying silly things because you need it. Now, sometimes that money is used for, you know, needed equipment or, you know, good purposes, but not always. So there's a budget process. Um, the budget is like a, establishes a schedule of key actions and decision points. And basically the budget, <laughs> budgeting happens all year long long and it keeps going over and over again you're always looking at the budget usually um when you budget you're looking at historical data it's common to look at the last three or five years and usually uh budgeting starts usually four or five months before the end of the fiscal year so meaning like in you know in december people are starting to do budgeting for the next year because um, you got to gather information, review all of it, um, may have target dates for making decisions. So in budget, usually, obviously, you start you plan the process. Who's going to contribute to the budgeting process? Staff, board members, community, like who? 
You agree on key definitions and assumptions and how the documents. You set timelines and key deadlines. You determine the schedule uh, and any training or key meetings. You then communicate this process, what you've developed. You communicate the responsibilities, the expectations, and deadlines. You have to explain and distribute the forms and all the assumptions. Make sure everyone's on the same page. Then you have to set up goals. So, um, for example, project staffing requirements and salary and, um, and benefit assumptions based on program goals. You need like agreement from everyone admin. You then have to gather information. So that's researching and gathering information about income and expenses, developing a detailed budget, and you're communicating regularly to avoid duplication of effort to share the information or assumptions. Next, you have to compile and revise the information. One person usually does this, reviews it for consistency and distributes it to everyone. Lot, leaving lots of time for review and revisions. There's usually a committee that reviews the first draft. Usually the finance committee and other staff are on that. Um, and again, enough time between meetings and final approval to address questions and recommendations, make decisions. Then they have to spend time on the final approval. So this might be like for not-for-profit, it's the board, but it's obviously like, you know, city council and stuff when it for public. Um, and, you know, there's usually like uh, committees or the treasurer presents the budget. Then you have to implement and manage the budget. Again, communicating the budget, your goals and timelines, review of uh, you know, regular review throughout the year of actual income and expenses compared to what you thought the budget would be. And you got to update and revise, you know, as you go along throughout the year. So I'm just going to give an example of uh, budgeting at the local level, so municipal. So, for example, um, now in a uh, Municipal, I guess, often it's a, a January 1st is the fiscal year. So they actually, um, might, they may be doing, yeah, a, a year, it's actual yearly for, for public, okay? Um, whereas some other organizations, it's not. For example, in, um, well, at mine, it's a year end is, uh, is April. Um, so usually, let's say it's, if it's January, then in October, so that's, you know, you can see that's uh, three or four months ahead. They submit drafts. Each each department would submit a draft. So, for example, the manager for the recreation department sits, submits a draft, and that might be in competing with the manager of parks or the manager of community services. Um, these all these proposals get reviewed, and they have to revise and resubmit, and it goes to city council. November, the budget committee reviews the drafts. Again, they revise and resubmit. Um, again, they review the resubmissions and go to the budget committee. Then the budget committee approves and sends it to city council. Usually in December, the city council votes on the budget. If it's rejected, it's returned to the department heads and it goes back and goes on and on. Um, if it's adopted, then everything is developed into these what budgeted line items. So there are obviously roadblocks and challenges to budgeting. One is padding the budget. You know, that's, I've talked about that, like, it's kind of putting a, a sorry, I forget the word I used previously. I started with Anessa. Um, the process of increasing expenditure requests to in excess, you know, um, and it means, you know, you have more money. So line items are sufficiently descriptive to help the board understand whether they are not, they're padded or not. You know, like we look at that, even with like grants or anything, research money, you can tell when something seems a bit padded. There can also be pet projects as we've talked about. Um, everyone has something they want to see added and again is political. Um, you, uh, another problem can be when people ignore previous year's performance. That's really bad. So you really need to look at trends. So 
So how are budgets used to make decisions? Well, it helps you to see if your goals are being achieved, and if not, you can re-examine and realign the goals. Um, the managers, you know, if goals aren't being achieved, then managers have the responsibility to see, you know, see that and realign the goals so the bottom line will be achieved. It's also about evaluating how uh, line item budget goals are being reached. Um, so you're wanting to make sure that you're achieving um, the revenue and expenditure line items are not the ultimate objective. Achieving the bottom line is. For me, I think I've got a mistake here. Sorry. I'm just going to put these because I don't like. Pardon me. I didn't mean to have all that coming in stuff. So you're looking then to see if each line item is fairly valued. And if not, you can you know, take appropriate action. So a decision to act based on the selection of the of the problem. So for example, I'm just gonna put this in better, uh, more common language. This means that you know you look at let's say each month you could see like whoa what's going on? Um, our we are way overspending on our let's say our water budget, <laughs> uh, what we normally spend, uh, and then you might note why is the water. Um, way over what is supposed to be each month. Well, you might realize that, you know, well, maybe there's a leak in the building or something like that. Uh, and so you're overusing water or, um, you know, and so you can uh, take an act, take action. Or you see that a program is way not uh, performing, that they didn't get hardly any registrants and you're really losing money. Well, then you can do something about that. Maybe you need to put money into marketing. So you look line by line at the budget revenues and expenditures with actual revenues and expenditures. And you use these as monthly bench benchmarks. And you look, you know, what's in the budget versus your monthly reports. So then you can have staff meetings to make adjustments when there are shortfalls in revenues or there's overages in expenditures. There's also different types of budget theories or methods. One is called incremental budgeting, the other is called zero-based budgeting. Incremental budgeting is the process of using historical revenue and expense data and revising it slightly. Where zero-based budgeting is the process of starting from scratch with every department and line item requiring justification to exist. Okay, so incremental budgeting is used on historical uh, data and maybe just slightly revised. Zero-based budgeting is you don't look at the history usually and you go, uh, you have to make a justification for every single line on the budget. Most companies actually use a combination. For example, for let's say a department um, that's doing well, they might use incremental budgeting, whereas a, a department that's struggling, um, you might use zero-based budgeting. So as I just said, uh, incremental budgeting is best applied um, to departments or businesses that are doing well, making, project, uh, making profit. So, um, and Again, it's basically, so you're not basically wasting time doing all this budgeting. You're kind of just looking at pat the past. Zero-based budgeting is largely theoretical <laughs> and is really actually applied in pure, pure form. But it's basically, so there's no assumptions. And every single line item in the budget is required to prove that there's a reason it, it should exist and how it contributes to the bottom line. It's often used for unprofitable departments. And um, it's often used, uh, um, it, well, it's used a lot actually in, gov in public, in government. 
Then there's what's called variance analysis, and this is part of looking at budgets. So variance analysis um, is uh, explained, uh, you know, it, you look at that with financial reports. Each line item is of a budget is compared with the actual, and that's called variance analysis. What we thought, what we predicted, and what we actually spent or money we got in. And that's where, you know, that variance, you can kind of see, you know, how far off were you? Or, you know, it could be a, it could be a positive thing. For example, you might have thought that you weren't going to have many participants and in fact you had lots and you actually had revenue come in. So line item budgeting is kind of, is part of like a uh, part of like zero based budgeting. And it's when um, balance sheets and income states, they, they look backwards. They look at the la last fiscal year where budgets are looking forward. They're predicting. So you're usually comparisons are done during the fiscal year again to adjust. And sometimes there's more details provided with each line item that is going on. So line by line of the budget. Corporations actually often write budgets five years ahead. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. But they usually have like these moving averages, which um, it's statistical average with a range of dates that are updated each year by adding the most recent, you know, recent information. Uh, and it makes companies less de dependent on economic forecasts to predict revenue. So line items are simply the individual listings in a budget. They're different categories and expenses. And the detail that you give, um, it really depends on the organization as well as management. Um, you might need a lot or you might not. For example, some people might just say supplies where other um, there might other people might you might have to actually list what type of supplies, you know. You have to have enough detail to guide management decisions, but if you have too much detail, it can make it the budgeting process tedious and very difficult to interpret. So, pardon me, so it's important for you to understand, I didn't actually mean to have this slide here, but there are two terms, line item accounts. And the way I think of line item accounts, sorry, I've got here like electricity. I think of it like, um, like in your own household, for example, I have a category on my Excel sheet for personal, my personal um, banking, and I call it utilities. Utilities then has three diff uh, different categories. I have electricity, then you've got like uh, water, gas, okay, that, uh, and then you have like telephone and internet. So I might have all those as different lines. Balance sheets. So again, we're going to be talking about balance sheets next week. Here, I just want to introduce briefly. So a balance sheet is a statement that shows the financial condition of an organization. The purpose is to show the proportion of various assets, liabilities, and equity. As I explained already, um, this is called a um, it's called a balance sheet in the private sector, statement of financial position and not-for-profit, and statement of net assets in, in public. In the private sector, and this is basically what all these things look at, what the information on a balance sheet are assets. You look at current, fixed, and the total. We also look at liabilities, short and long-term liabilities, as well, as well as equity. Again, we'll, we'll get into what all these mean next week. Um, in not-for-profit, it's the statement of financial position. It contains same thing, assets, liabilities, but, um, or, but it's like net assets or the fund balance. In uh, the public sector, it'd be, you know, statement of, it's also a statement of financial position or net assets. 
Um, and it shows, you know, what it's like in the government unit. It's very similar. Um, it's, re it's really the, the difference between the assets and liabilities to show the wealth of an entity, whether it's like local pro provincial or provincial. In the public sector, again, they're very similar to these balance sheets. They look at assets, they look at current and long-term liabilities, but again, they're looking at what's called the fund balance. So the difference between the current assets and liabilities is called a fund balance. They have multiple funds. So, um, how are the public and nonprofit uh, documents different from balance sheets? Well, uh, in a statement of financial position or net assets, it shows uh, depreciated assets. And but basically, they're very similar. It's just it's just more about the words. Like they're not using the term equity or um, and it might be more complicated because you may have multiple funds. You might have one of these statements for each of your different funds. Then there's income statements. So again, in a couple of weeks, we're going to go into more about income statements. But these then, they're reports that provide a picture of the income and expenses of an organization at a certain time I, I for a fund or, or for the or, uh, organization. The format's fairly standard. Um, sometimes you put like previous years for the sake of transparency, like for a couple of years. And uh, sometimes uh, like in the public sector, sometimes certain categories don't account for uh, smaller companies. They have a specific order. They have a sequence of events and they really basically are looking at how profitable a company is, considering its overhead and indirect expenses. It's looking at the gross profit margin. You've probably heard of that. So how is a balance sheet different from an income statement? Well, a balance sheet is the financial condition at a given point in time, where income statements show why the balance sheet changed over time. It's more looking at the efficiency and the value. So on an income statement, we look at different things and we'll be talking more about these, but these are many of the terms I've mentioned earlier in this lecture that you're going to need to know. Revenue, cost of goods sold, gross profit margin, looks at overhead expenses, operating income and margin, non-operating expenses, Income before tax, and then we also look at net income after tax, etc. In the not for profit and public, it's called the statement of activities or operations. As I said, it's different for Canadian and American. It's the same sort of thing. It shows revenues, expenditures, and changes in the balance. You know, it's designed to show how money was used during that year and how it changed the financial position of the nonprofit organization or sorry, the public organization. And two more things just to talk about is the statement of cash flows and then uh, net assets, change in net assets. So this I'm not, we're not gonna learn more about later on. This is it. This is your one time to learn about the statement of cash flows. So, Statement of cash flow is the movement of money. It shows, um, it's a report that shows the total changes in cash and cash equivalents resulting from the activities of an organization. So, um, and it's, you have to uh, disclose where these cash and cash equivalents came from. So it's money. It's about when you've got money coming in and out of, of accounts derived from revenue streams. So as an example, like um, the like a, an organization, for example, let's say month, it might it has to do a statement of cash flows because it has to show like 
look, we took money out of this one fund and let's say uh, the the money to pay for salaries for faculty. We had, um, let's say we had some people on sabbatical or retirement, so we didn't use all the money. Then we get to use that money and stick it into another fund for something else. Well, the statement of cash flows documents that, and it's again, it's about transparency. There's two types of cash flows. There's inflows and outflows. Uh, inflows are derived from revenue stream and are created by revenue and non-revenue engines, whereas outflows are created by expenses. Sometimes your outflows, what's going out, is way higher than what's coming in. And that can be bad. So a statement of cash flows helps you to manage that. It makes sure that your uh, your inflows and your outflows are, are matching. But sometimes in not-for-profit and public sector, um, you might need a, a bridge loan. And that's a short-term loan used until permanent financing is secured or the obligation is met. Uh, and Basically, it's a small loan that happens in order to bridge you during the time when your outflows are greater than your inflows. Now, I might be changing a bit about the exam review for this unit, and I, you'll notice I haven't posted anything yet. I have to figure uh, this out a little bit more. But essentially, on for this unit, you need to understand the generally accepted accounting principles. Um, went through them all and understand why these are important for us to not, to know. You need to understand about transparency, and we've talked about this in other units, kind of just an important theme of this class, to be able to define it and discuss why it's important. I'd like you to understand fund accounting, be able to discuss what fund accounting is and what the problems might be. You also need to identify and discuss the three types of categories of funds, restricted, endowment, and unrestricted. For budgeting, I want you to be able to identify and discuss the purpose of a budget. Why is it political? Um, what are some roadblocks or problems that can happen? And also, how is a budget used to make decisions as a management tool? And then also to be able to look at, uh, discuss the different types of budget theory. So understand what incremental budgeting is, zero-based budgeting, and variance analysis. And I should have added their line item budgeting. Um, we're going to be going in way a lot of detail about some of these uh, financial statements, you know, balance sheets and income statements. So for right now, for exam one, um, the, the, the other units will be on exam two. For exam one, I want you to just basically sort of understand the differences between these financial statements. Also kind of understand the difference of, about them in terms of the three sectors. Uh, be able to identify the difference in the different sectors. Also, you should note on the exam, I'm going to be giving all the different words um, that it could be so it's not confusing. Um, you know, for example, um, I would put statement of operations slash activities or, uh, you know, I, I would differentiate so that because the textbook uses one term, whereas in Canada we use another and I want you to be able to understand them all. Right, and that's it for our introduction to uh, financial management. Um, and, you know, obviously most of this lecture then is building blocks that you now need to, uh, we're going to be using for um, the rest of the course on balance sheets and income statements.